you know, there's a concept that in surfing, that when the waves are running, everyone's a good surfer, right? Judge people by when the waves aren't running. And I think right now, who's going to come out of this, how they're going to come out of it, is not going to be a unilateral movement. It's going to be very, very rifle specific. Some people are going to get crushed. Some people are going to come out of it. Some people are going to think they came out of it. And five years down the line, they'll realize that they didn't come out of it. All right, welcome back to the Wits Podcast. Once again, we have a wicked awesome guest today, Mr. Mike Aaron, who's got 25 years of global experience in corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, banking and entrepreneurship. He is the co-founder and director of Sedell Bank and Trust, an international private bank, and co-founder of various alternative investment funds. And while he's been doing all of this, he still manages his own family office. And prior to Sedell, he was also the senior executive at Bayshore Bank and senior manager at KPMG. This dude has got a wicked background, including the fact that he's a chartered accountant and today we're going to talk about a ton we're going to talk about what it takes to make it in today's economy you know what are some some values that we need to ensure that we're living not just in our personal life but our professional life to ensure success uh investment ideas what the future looks like and again just how do we live what we call real-time strategy i don't think there's a better person to be talking to today considering our current climate mike welcome to the show so mike um why don't we start off with the big question i mean you know you run a lot of businesses you're, you've, you've started businesses, you've been around the corporate world, living in today's economic climate. Give us your take. I mean, let's just start with there. Like, I mean, what do you think is going out there in business? What's the next year of business looking like? Do you think we're, we're going to come out of this maybe sooner? I think if anything that today's world has taught us all, it's humbled us all and ensured that any person who's active in business, leadership of any format is just a student. So someone asked me recently, they came to me and said, Mike, you know, one of the things you've always admired about you is you're a strategist, and that translates into tactics. <laughs> and I looked at this person and I said, I don't think anyone's a strategist at the moment. I think at this moment in time, it's purely tactical. Mm -hmm. And every day and every week for me is a zig and a zag. Mm -hmm. So when you say tactical, what do you mean? Like more like instinctual, like, uh, like your obviously strategy has been thrown out and now it's, it's, it's almost like living real time strategy. Correct. So I think of a strategist as when you start a chess game, you know what the end in sight is and you work backwards with your moves. I think this is more like a, like a checkers game, like a backgammon game. Yeah. Where you, you're moving because you have to move and your, your opponent, let's call it, or the other side's waiting for you to move but to know ultimately where you're moving towards is purely based, I think, based on experience, instincts, and who you listen to. Mm -hmm. I think it's never been a more important time now than to listen to a deep and wide bench of wisdom and experience. Because you say, do we think we're going to come out of it? I think, you know, in the good old days, you know, there's a concept that in surfing that when the waves are running, everyone's a good surfer, right? judge people by when the waves aren't running. And I think right now, who's going to come out of this, how they're going to come out of it, is not going to be a unilateral movement. It's going to be very, very rifle specific. Some people are going to get crushed. Some people are going to come out of it. Some people are going to think they came out of it. And five years down the line, they'll realize that they didn't come out of it. Um, just to jump on one more thing, Greg, you know, some people say to me, I'm coming out of it, I'm coming out of it. And I say, how are you coming out of it? So, well, uh, you know, I've got some hard money debt. Mm -hmm. to get me through the next few months or alternatively I brought in a bunch of uh, new private equity type people and the question I ask him is so how are you coming out of it mm. what do you mean I said well if you've got hard money debt at 15% you're going to work the next three years for those lenders right so you probably have nothing at the end you brought in a whole lot of private equity money I'm assuming it was a low valuation so you've been heavily diluted so again how are you going to come out of it I think those are the kind of questions we really have to ask ourselves now. Yeah, so there's that wonderful saying, there's no such thing as free money. I hear people say that all the time. Oh, it's cheap money right now. And I'm like, yeah, but what happens when you spend that money and you owe on it like, you know, years later? But, you know, I'm in that position as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you know, you know, cash is king right now, right? So where's the balance? I mean, what advice would you give me when it came down to things like, you know, borrowing and bringing in that equity? Because you're an entrepreneur, I've seen your bio, right? You're a true entrepreneur. You know, you take on challenges. You embrace risk as opportunity as opposed to fear. So you're a person 
that naturally should be looking at cost of capital now. If I can bring on cash at 5%, you have to say that's my opportunity cost, that's my hurdle rate on the cash I bring in. Being an entrepreneur, I embrace a calculated fear and calculated risk, but I feel confident that over a three-year time frame, I can generate a delta of somewhere between 3 and 5% on that cost of capital. We know it's not guaranteed, but you've proven that you're a person that can go through a wall if you have to. Mm-hmm. Some people that are singularly focused business people, but not entrepreneurs, meaning they've had one business that say automotive manufacturing business, let's just say. That's what they've done their whole life. They've never really branched out of that singular line of business strategy. I'm not sure they're an entrepreneur. I think they're a good business person. Right. That, would that, should that person be taking on money net right now, um, sort of debt? I would say no, because I'm not sure that they're going to zig and zag to get that delta on the cost of capital. You know, in some regards, there's the, uh, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, right? But you just said something, a really good business person, right? I mean, is that the difference between maybe what a really solid, good business person is versus that entrepreneur is the ability to zig and zag and, you know, adapt and pivot? I hate the word pivot because it's overused so much right now. But is, is that how you characterize it? You know, it's funny because I had a discussion. My son has a bunch of uh, friends who recently came from New York and they're all finishing business school. And I overheard a conversation. One guy says, I want to be an entrepreneur. And the other guy said, why? Freedom and flexibility of an entrepreneur. I couldn't help but ask the person and say, you want to be an entrepreneur? During your high school and college years, what have you done that's entrepreneurial? Right. The kid has done nothing. I said, it strikes me that an entrepreneur doesn't get created. It's almost like the concept of a diamond. You take a diamond out of the ground. It's dirty. It's murky. But you polish it. Right. You can't take a piece of coal out of the ground and polish it and make it into a diamond. Right. So I said to this young man, I said, I think based on what you tell me about yourself, you could probably be a good business person. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that you're necessarily an entrepreneur. I'm sure like you remember when you were like 10 years old and you were trading something to yeah. create. I was, hustling, I was hustling garbage pail kit cards back in the day, right? Which were in the, you know, like a baseball card, but, you know, gross test little characters puking up and doing nasty little things on these cards. But yeah, that was, I, in fact, I remember my first, first, in fact, I've just had this flashback now where I bought a pack of garbage pail cards from, from this kid at school. I can't even remember who, but it was this whole negotiation. I think I negotiated something like, uh, some rands, there's definitely some rands in there, uh, and uh, some sort of like contribution. I can't remember what it is, but yeah, you know, I think so. What did, how did that guy take it? I mean, what did this kid say? Was he insulted? Was he, was, was he like, thank you for like, you know, helping me clarify where I should be going? I don't think that uh, that age group, that 20 to 23 year old age group, likes to be told or likes to be um, receive input that doesn't correlate with their own self image. Right. My sense is that this particular person that kind of looked at me and said, like, what does he know? Some of his friends got it and actually <laughs> concurred. Because he said to me, so what did you do when you were that age? I said, well, when I was 10 years old, I used to walk around the suburb, my suburb, and go to people who were too lazy to take their Coca-Cola and Sprite bottles back to get a deposit. And I collect them all. I go get the deposits. I've got to keep them. And the other thing is all my buddies like to play pinball at the local variety store. Their parents didn't. So they'd pay me to stand watch. And then I had cash, and with that cash, I bought and sold things. So the guy's like, yeah, well, those opportunities don't exist anymore. I said, but there is something. And right. if you read that, then I'd say, good, you're going to be an entrepreneur. Right. But I mean, it's, you know, the, uh, the, there are those opportunities right now. There's a thousand percent. You could literally all jokes aside. I mean, Gary Vee talks about this all the time, which is go to a like, garage sale, right? In your local neighborhood, find that sort of gem that's there for five bucks. That's worth 50, stick it on eBay and Bob's your uncle kind of thing. Right. Um, I think, you know, people, and maybe to this point, maybe that generation, they think just too macro, which is, it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's all or nothing. Right. I don't understand the path. And, you know, I would never call myself an entrepreneur back in the day. Today I would, you know, 23, 24 years into it. 
what do you do? Well, I, uh, fuck, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> well, why? Well, I run this business and like, you know, it's, it's bobbing and weaving and it's, you know, I'm always looking to sort of add and build and create and find something else to sell and find another way to build success, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I like what you said before, which is that whole diamond analogy, which is, you know, these things are not made. They're, they're polished. Polished is a, is a great word. Cool. So tell me, you know, back to this whole running a business. I mean, you know, what do you think it takes today to maybe have that combination of both to be a great business uh, person and an entrepreneur? Can those two worlds intersect? Great question. You know, Greg, I think it depends tremendously on the person. I'm a guy, my best successes have always came when I partnered with somebody who complemented my strengths and weaknesses. So I know, and over the years, I'm, you know, I'm in my late fifties now, I've come to really understand my natural skill is not to be hyper-focused on running a business. My natural skill is to create opportunities and partner with people that become hyper-focused on actualizing those opportunities. And to be honest with you, I haven't met a lot of entrepreneurs who had that unique ability to combine the entrepreneurial creativity with a very, very ex good execution consistently of the strategy. So I've always been the person that partners with that. I've never ever, I don't think, uh, I don't think in scarcity, I think in abundance. The right partner creates abundance. It doesn't, then, it doesn't diminish my return. Yeah. I would think find that person that one has displayed a consistency of hyper-focus and loyalty mm -hmm. and you partner with that person. But more importantly, I think in today's time, is find a person who's still optimistic and hasn't been beaten up by the COVID era of economics and it's now a cynic. Right. Because we can't partner with cynics. It's just right. like everything we stand for. Right. I, look, I've, I've let people go because I just found myself being so negative just being around these people, even before COVID. Uh, um, and because for me, it's important. I need to I, uh, call me sensitive, call me a, an entrepreneur that runs at a high frequency, which I am affected by who's around me. So, you know, they're not that everyone has to walk around in this warm, fuzzy world and think sunshine's coming down every single day. But, you know, someone that's, you know, not going to be that cynic or that's, you know, skeptic every single time. You know, partnership is difficult. Right. I mean, I, I remember early lessons instilled to me by some call it, you know, leaders in my life were don't have a partner with anyone. Right. You don't need a partner. But, you know, I think I think to your point, it's 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 recognize that's the vulnerability I think you were talking about earlier, which is, you know, are you willing to be vulnerable enough to recognize where your strengths are and they're not? And how do you now mesh that together with someone else? But, you know, I hear more partnerships failing than succeeding. So what are the success secrets for a partnership? What are some must-haves, some, some, you know, do's, don'ts? It, it depends a lot on the personality. But in my case, I think that direct, frank authenticity is essential. Mm -hmm. when, when I talk with my partners, and by the way, of course, I've had failed partnerships as well. I think there are a couple of points mm -hmm. that are one, consistent, authentic, transparent conversation. Don't soft soap anything. Mm -hmm. And I really, this is one that's so important to me. You have to know each other's spouses or partners. Mm -hmm. Very often the partner shows up at work asking for more money or asking for changes. And you know it's not them talking. Mm -hmm. You know what's going on at home. Yeah. Yeah. The spouse feels frustrated because in their mind, their partner is doing all the work and you not, and they want more money. Some people are unable to convey to their spouses that that's not the case and they start get driven by what happens at home. Right. So my wife and I have made a point of getting to know the couple on the other side and having regular six week meetings, whether it's a dinner or a coffee, just to communicate how we all feeling because you have to know the other side. Because when, that per when your partner leaves the office, the, the office. Right. <laughs> Not that there's an office anymore, right? <laughs> Air quotation, quotations. They go home to a different set of stimuli. Right. And you have to know how that affects your partnership. Yeah. The other thing is the abundance mentality. You know, when, when things are rough in business, and we all know that happens, is you have to lock arms and stand side by side. You can't be facing each other and at each other. 
And even back-to-back -back doesn't work that well because you don't know the sweat on each other's foreheads. You stand side to side and you just keep on moving. So that's the bad time. But in good times, it's so important to know each other's core values. One, your one partner might say, I'm going to go and buy a Lamborghini and take my wife on a private plane to some island. Mm -hmm. That's never been my style ever, but it doesn't mean it's wrong for that person's style. You just have to make sure you keep on understanding each other. Yeah. And you're okay with that in that sense? Like, let's say one partner wants to, you know, just live the high life. Like, is it, is it, is it easy to not judge that considering we have different values? Well, you know, it's, I had a partner in Europe and a British guy, and he always had Ferraris and blah, blah, blah. So whatever he made, he'd spend 110%. And the first thing that I did was we canceled his corporate credit card. <laughs> you must have not liked that. Spend what you like. Yeah. And just expense reports if it's relevant to the business. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, over time, I've actually had to lend him rent money, but I only did it once. Mm -hmm. If I would have tried to change him to be more like me, that would have caused a problem in our partnership. I just kept on trying to live my way and hope that he gained some wisdom from that or gained some example. He chose not to, but he was a good partner in the context of our business. So I just had to like suck it up and just keep on saying, listen, bud, that's your lifestyle. I build a balance sheet. You build income statements. Right. I don't consume only. I build and then consume. You consume and don't build. At some stage, we're going to diverge in lifestyle where you can't afford it, and that'll affect our business. But right now, we're good business partners. And we had that conversation. Yeah. Are you still, are you still partners? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not because uh, he got divorced, and then the little that he did have, his wife took everything, and then it just fell apart. And I helped him a period of time. But, you, you know, the interesting thing about it was is that I enjoy his company, and that he was a good guy, and we're good, we're good at being partners. But he thought I was absolute crazy. He couldn't used to call me cheap and all these different things. And I just thought, no, listen, I, I'm playing a long game. Doesn't mean I'm right and doesn't mean you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Just different ways of, being, of lifestyle. I, I've lived this for a long time. I don't want to work with anyone that I don't have a relationship with and are part of their lives, which specifically includes things like spouses and kids. Doesn't mean we get together all the time, but you know, having that intimacy. And look, I'm a smaller outfit. You know, sometimes it's easier to do it that way. But, you know, we're so, you, 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 uh, a partnership is like a marriage, right? You know, the, jo the joke is, is, you know, you, the partners, it's, you create new in-laws with the spouses, right? So you know how you always complain about your in-laws. Oh, your mother, or your father, or your uncle Tom, or, you know, Aunt Betty or whatnot, right? We have strife with, with, with our family. And, and, you know, I, I love that concept of making sure that you're, you're connected with the spouses. It's a joke is you don't marry the, marry the person, you marry their family, right? One thing, Greg, if I can just quickly add is before I start a new partnership, I show them my family value statement mm -hmm. and I ask them to write up their family value statement. It doesn't have to be honest, concise. And then what we do is we do a four monthly check-in. We put in our calendar, what's changed in our family value statement or what has, if, or if there's no changes. And I think that's a good thing. It kind of shows us if we're in sync on that. Yeah, you know what? Are you comfortable talking about that? Comfortable sharing what your value, uh, family value statements are? Absolutely. And I have four sons. I think if you ask all four, they'll be able to rattle it off. So one is um, in the morning we wake up and but for the grace of God go I, you know. We wake up in the morning, God brought me back into the world physically and here I am. Two is family no matter what, you don't have to like them. You don't have to love them, but you have to honor, nurture, protect, and empower them. And family doesn't just mean your media family. It means your extended family. And depending on how you conduct yourself, it can, it can include friends and community. Mm. But you don't, get, you don't get to decide on family. They are your blood and your extended blood. Nurture, protect, empower, and nourish them. That's it. No questions asked. Next one is we associate and become close to net contributors to society. Before we start consuming, we ensure we contribute first. Mm. Might mean you have a smaller circle of friends and might mean you do business with less people, but associate with net contributors. Number four, we run our own race. If we come home, my son says to me, dad, we won the soccer game. They know the next question is going to be, how did you play? 
because winning the soccer game is just a, a number. It's other people's races. How did you play? If you played well, then you won today. If you had a bad day, you didn't win today. So we don't let other people tell us how rich we should be, how rich we shouldn't be, how to conduct ourselves, what cars we could drive. We have to know ourselves and run our own race. And number five is you are your own living will. Every single day, how you conduct yourself is how people will talk to you when you're not around to conduct yourself. So therefore, you are your living will. It doesn't make sense to write it out, hope that someone reads it later, if it contradicts the way you conducted yourself while you were alive. Wow. That's That's a- <laughs> Man, uh, it's amazing. And, and I'm not just saying that in the sense that like most people don't live like this. People, people are living too fast in today's world, right? And you know, you hear it all the time and people are like paying fortunes of money to hear the same message all the time. Be grateful, right? Stay persistent, you know, uh, surround yourself with, with people that lift you and, and, and contribute. Give before asking, contribute first before consuming and stuff. And by definition, you're not just sort of, you know, rhyming these things out. Like if anyone knows you, you actually do live and breathe these things. So I hope so. How do these show up in business? Are they the same values in business? Exact same values. Let's go through number one. But for the grace of God, go on. My wife and I really think that whatever's on our balance sheet is not ours. We're just custodians of it. She hmm. does well. And that at any moment in time, we have seen so many wealthy people just lose it against all logic. We really believe that God has blessed us to be custodians of these assets do a good job of being custody. So that's number one. In terms of family, we are very focused that none of our nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles should feel that they're worried about how they'll pay tuition, how they'll live a middle-class lifestyle while we don't have any of those worries. And we feel blessed to be able to lift up family as well. Even if we're not sure if we like them that much, it doesn't matter, they're still family. And number three, the net contributor, we've lived in a lot of communities and lived in a lot of countries. The minute we arrive, it's the same in business. The minute I meet a business partner, mm-hmm. you're my family now. So therefore, I lift you. I don't want to be living a certain stable life and you not. I lift you. When we arrive in a community, when we go to EO or YPO, whatever it is, before we say, what can you give me? The first thing is, how can we help? What committees do you need people on? How can we stand up for you? My wife immediately goes into the not-for-profit world. How can I work? Not how can I be on boards for the net. How can I work? So that's the net contributor. Running our own race, how does it translate into business? When we have what, let's call KPIs, key performance indicators, I have my own personal ones with my partner. and say, this is what I'm trying to build from this business. Very often it's to nurture and empower entrepreneurs and part of the team so they become rich and wealthy as well at that stage i continue to grow in my own balance sheet mm-hmm. but for me it's, it's not about the numbers it's about the value attributed to the numbers so make sure that our business like we don't no hustling no scams eternal value when you do business your customers should feel that there's a longing a long ongoing value by what you create and, and, uh, and build mm-hmm. that's that part and then the living world part you know is a uh, some of our businesses haven't worked out, but I'm quite proud to say I don't think any of my partners hate me or are angry with me. I think that they still have respect for me. So that's the living world part, I guess, in business. You know, not everything works out, but we still like each other, I think. <laughs> I hope. You know, you you hear the the term radical conversations, right? You were talking about having these like authentic, being authentic and making sure you're having in quotations the tough conversations, but you know, I think in a place of empathy and support, not attack. I was going to say, it's nothing personal. It's just the partnership goal. You know? Yeah. It's hard, man. You know, look, people are hard. I mean, this is what my business is about. It's why I'm in business is because if people were easy, partnerships, marriages, business decisions, conversations, raising kids, this would all just be smooth, right? Uh, but we, we, we get into emotions and we get into personal needs and stuff. Have your partners been able to live up to these values the way you describe them? I always just say, if you really want to know what a partner's about, go to the the kids' weddings, bar mitzvahs, christenings, whatever it is. See how many old friends and old business friends are at there. If everybody's new, (laughs) steer clear of them, right? 
I, I'm blessed in my son's wedding recently in January. I had so many people I've been doing business with for 15 plus years. And I'm like, like I looked at myself and I said, I guess these partnerships have worked out. Obviously, there's some that haven't. You know, people, people change. Money comes in. An honest person becomes a little gray and then greedy and then maybe a uh, crook. You've got to watch that, right? Um, but yeah, I would like to think that most of my partnerships uh, have worked out and I have phenomenal friends as a result of that and I cherish that. Yeah, well, I think that comes back to the point we were talking about before, you know, you need to have relationships with people. You need to feel connected. You know, for, for bluntly, as I said earlier, for me, I need to like you. I need to want to eat with you and invite you into my house and I want you to meet my kids. And if I have that feeling, then the rest is easy, right? You, know, you did ask me one thing about current economic times, but I can just quickly tell. I was on a podcast where Mark Cuban was speaking. Oh, cool. Something amazing. He said that today's world is 100% different. Whatever didn't work before COVID might work now and vice versa. Right. He spends five hours a day learning new skills. He has a multi-billionaire. He said he's learning programming, AI. Five hours a day is learning new stuff so that he can go into the new world educated and I thought like wow we should all be doing that you know that's pretty remarkable you know you were talking about being a student and I think you know to that point any successful human being you want to define it as business or relationships or maybe they're just living the dream whatever every successful human being there are some common denominators and one of them is is learning wanting to learn getting excited to learn um you know craving new things you know my, my wife thinks i'm nuts because i'm always taking on a new hobby and i'm just i try to explain to her like sometimes it's not just the hobby it's the excitement of learning you know because you know learning that thing is going to transpire into or be transferable into something else um you know when all this went down with covid one of the first things i did was double down and like trying to learn um, certain softwares to produce online learning and stuff. And the joke I make now with the company is I say, we've gone from being a training company to a video production company. Like we, like, you know, you want to ask me about cameras and gear and like video and lights and stuff. It's, it's, it's a whole new world. And Kwame, who you've been seeing walking in and out, we talk about this all the time. Like, you know, this is this, the world of video and, and broadcasting and stuff. It's, it's a whole new skill set. You're right. I like what he said, which is that whole, what didn't work might work and what, you know, did work um, might not work. You're a professional zigger and zagger. You zigged and zagged. There you go. Yeah, there you go. But that's, that's been my motto for life, man. That's how I drive as well. Everyone's like, why don't you just slow down? I'm like, no, this is me in my metaphoric success car, right? Zigging and zagging as fast as I can to get to the goal and the objective and stuff. You know, uh, you got four kids, four boys, right? How old are they? Age groups from? Yeah, yeah, 24, 21, 18, and 13. Okay, so they're fresh in it, right? This is the, the demographic. These are the kids or the young adults that are now moving into the world. What do they have to look out for? I mean, if there's some valuable lessons that you say, look, you know, here are some, some things that you're going to have to navigate in today's world and you're going to have to be really good at or you're going to be stressed out or this is what you're going to hit. What are those things? Like, how do you coach your kids to... to to kick ass as entrepreneurs, as business people? Wow, it's a lovely question. It's tough, I think, right? Uh, yeah, so I think what I try and tell them is there's a big difference between intelligent and wise. And in today's world, everybody claims to be highly intelligent. Seek those that are wise. People that have a combination of intelligence and established experience who have low egos and really want to share their wisdom. Seek those people out in your teachers, in your leaders, in your rabbis, in your spouses, whatever it may be. Really seek those people out and show them respect and admiration. Mm -hmm. Ask them to adopt you as a mentor. And then I tell them to do this. I think I'm crazy, but I hopefully with time they will do it. Buy them dinner when you can do things like that. Yeah. And buy them every three months. And before you meet for that dinner, send them an email or a text, whatever you guys use. That just says, these are the things that are on my mind that I'd love to pick your brain on. So they can put some thought into it. Mm -hmm. Find those wise people in your life. That's the first thing I tell them. 
The other thing I tell them in today's world, because everything's changing so much, occupations, opportunities, business opportunities, is the chances are that you're going to do a lot of different things before you get 35. You're going to zig and zag in your So make sure whatever you do, do it so well that you take with you a good reference and reputation with it. Even if it's not what you're going to become. Right. It doesn't matter. My dad gave me that advice. He said, Mike, you're a chartered accountant, but you're not a chartered accountant. But you're going to go through working for KPMG as I did in Pricewater. Do it so well that you have a reference for life, even if it's not where you're going to be. And I try and tell them that. Yeah. The other thing is, I really try, but this is a hard one, is uh, read more and screens less, you know? Read more and spend less. That's a tough one. And I guess the last thing is have a good sense of who you are before you choose your spouse. Mm-hmm. In my case, I have a pretty remarkable wife and I have four boys. And I always just say to them, that's your benchmark. Mm-hmm. Choose someone that at least is like your mother. Mm-hmm. But choose well, man. People choose so easy to choose the wrong, the wrong person nowadays. So, and, and then by then they, they ask, well, over, okay, Dad, thanks for the advice I'm done. <laughs> but those are the things that I try and focus on. That's amazing. And, I, you know, to that point, I think people choose, choose jobs the way they choose marriages or partners, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, this sounds nice right now. Let's do it. And six months later, eight months later, ah, you know, I don't feel like it anymore. I, I got to tell you, so my, I don't want to say my entire peer group, but I'm going to round up to maybe 80% of, you know, my network, people, business life and, and personal life, community, people I went to high school with that, like, you know, they're just in community, divorced, divorced. And I think these are, these are young people. These are 35, 40, 45 years old, you know, young kids, three, five, six, eight years old, divorced. And it is the rare. And I looked at all these people and it's like they're into their next relationships and you just watch a pattern. And I see the same thing happening in jobs. In fact, I did a post recently, which was like, people have to stop applying for these titles because they sound nice. Like, look at the company. And I said something along the lines of like, look at what you could contribute to the role, right? How can you be part of this thing and, and, and contribute? Because the rest will take care of itself. The titles, the, the whole sort of nine. And I love what you talked about before, which is be the best you can. I, I've used this line forever, which is if, you're, if you flip burgers, you are the best burger flipper in town. No one flips better burgers than you. No one, no one gets that grill as hot. No one knows the spots though where, where they need to move. And, and you just love your craft. It's kind of like the old school tilers, right? There's people in trade. They just don't have the same craft as in some cases they once did. So call it traditional, but it's some of the old school stuff that works the best, right? My wife and I are celebrating our 30th anniversary in a month. And I always joke, I say the first 10 years she should have thrown me out. In the next 20 years, I've been thanking her for not throwing me out, right? <laughs> but, uh, There's the intelligence and experience. Right. Therefore, you're wise, right? So that's amazing, man. That's very, very, very cool. Look, Mike, this, is, this, is, this has been um, a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I think you're with, you are very wise. Right? I will ask you off camera if, you, if, if, if I could beg and borrow some of your time from a place of mentorship. Because uh, I'd love to just, you know, love to talk and, 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 and get, you know, just, just learn for as much as I can from you, man. I love it. I love being on boards. I love being on advisory boards because I love, first of all, at home, I hardly get a chance for anyone to listen to me. So it's great when I'm on these different things. People, <laughs> you know, I love doing that. I love empowering and mentoring young entrepreneurs because I think the world's a better place when people create their own destiny, you know. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I had one more question for you, which is, what are the future industries? I mean, what do you what do you see coming down? Where, uh, you know, what are some exciting industries? Where, what's 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 the future look like? Wow, I am struggling so hard with that. I, I have a good friend you should actually put on your uh, podcast. He uh, grew up in Toronto as well, um, ex South African, went to Caltech, yeah. got one of the highest uh, PhD marks ever, and in. in Far too, he probably has more patents than anybody else, but he's a really great guy. And he says, Mike, I'm telling my boys, and his boys are very smart as well. He says, plumbers, electricians, welders, forklift drivers. He said, because everybody's become so focused on technology and emerging technologies, but you still need those trades. 
And I've seen it in Israel, you know, they went away from trade schools and they put their money towards IT schools. They're now importing people from around the world to drive forklifts, welding. And these people are earning 70, 80 bucks an hour. So the question is, is when you say what is the future, is to somehow say, okay, clearly those are emerging industries. But in order for those emerging industries to be successful, what are the old industries that are going to survive? And start buying up those companies and start getting jobs in those companies and trying to accumulate equity because those companies are still going to have to be there. And everybody's neglected them. The valuations are neglected. The bankers don't lend to them. So I think, and maybe it's boring to say that, but I think there's some boring industries that are generating some serious cash flow that everybody's ignoring. And I think maybe those professions are, instead of trying to uh, compete with a herd running in that direction, maybe look at the old industries. Right. You know, things that require people, good old pair of hands. Yeah. And a machine. And a machine. Yeah. Someone has to operate the machine. Yeah. So I think that's probably what I would do. I know, listen, Mark Cuban spoke about AI and integration of AI and algorithms and all that. Mm-hmm. And of course, we all know about that. Mm-hmm. Learning, visual learning. But I think of all industries. Less competition, easier to succeed. <laughs> so hopefully for the audience, you know, as they're listening, they're making some notes, which is, you know, getting some great investment advice and, and, and uh, strategy from the one and only Mike Aaron. Well, Mike, I mean, any parting words, anything that you want to leave the audience with, words of wisdoms or uh, final thoughts? Yeah, well, I want to thank you, Greg, because I think what you're doing is taking people that are just the normal person on the street type of person and giving them a spotlight to talk about their value system, I think that's wonderful because most people are interviewing the bright light names. And I think some of their messages are misguiding some of the younger generations. Right. I appreciate what you're doing. And I think your library of wisdom that you're communicating to people is enduring wisdom that's going to lead to a world that's a better place for your young kids and, and my grandkids. So I thank you for what you're doing. I think it's wonderful. And I appreciate you doing that. Thank you, my man. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, awesome. Where can we find you? If someone wants to get in touch with you, uh, obviously we'll post all your contact that you at least allow us to do so, maybe like public channels. But I mean, any websites that you want people to check out or, you know, Instagram profiles? So I'm a pretty low profile guy. I don't even have any of those things. Mm-hmm. But you know, IGAN Partners is our um, Canadian venture capital fund, IGANpartners.com. It's always a good way to find me. Otherwise, my email, mike at michaelaaron.com. And um, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty responsive guy. I don't have like profiles and personal websites. Yeah. Not for any particular reason. It's just not something that I do. But love to be of help to anybody. Love to talk to anybody and uh, share with whatever I have that might, that might find a value. My pleasure. Amazing. Amazing. Well, we'll get that uh, also listed there. Mike Aaron, thank you so much for being on the show. We got a ton from you. Again, to your point, this is what it's about. We want to talk to people that are in it, successful CEOs and business leaders and community contributors and, you know, get advice because back to your point, sometimes these big wigs, it's all canned stuff, right? So uh, our brand stands for making humans better humans. And to your point, it's not just for us to do it, but it's for this this everlasting thing called kids, you know, how do we leave these kids much better in the world where they're able to think, communicate and contribute and make great decisions and just be effective human beings. So awesome. You represent all of this. It's been an absolute honor. We'll probably have to get you back for part two as well. And thank you very much. All right. If you like today's episode, don't forget to click that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to comment. And uh, we will see you next time. Hey, I'm Greg Witz. Thanks so much for coming and checking out the video. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. So I'd highly suggest that you click this video over here. And don't forget to subscribe and share.